Right, we're going to jump in uh, this morning into kind of a short um, mini-series of a three to four different subjects that we're going to be covering over the next three weeks. And it's, it's coming out of my weaknesses. So they say if you preach from your weaknesses, you'll never run out of material. And so this is a message that I'm basically going to preach to myself this morning. But at this time of year, it becomes so incredibly important. We're going to be talking for the next couple of weeks about creating space and, and why that's important and how to have boundaries and margin in your life so that God can move in your life because he wants to and so that we don't go absolutely crazy in the process. I keep telling myself after planning for the, the convention and then everything else that happened then right back to sports camp and then 4th of July, after Monday, um, I can finally get back to work and, and it'll be fun. I've been working like a million hours a week. And so I need this just as much as anybody. My guess is if you're in the heart of summer, you do too because boundaries are important. I'm kind of a a nut when it comes to extreme sports. Um, I love watching, and the video cameras are the best thing because we can capture all these events. We love seeing people like skate on the edge of, of uh, safety and, and, and kind of their reality without, without falling over. Like they have these big motorcycle jumps in the middle of halftime shows. Or if you're like us in our culture, the best thing in the world is to watch um, the biggest game that we have this time of year where the bison challenge the tourists in the park. <laughs> and if you're keeping track right now, it's bison three, tourist zero at this point. Um, it's the biggest problem. And I tell my friends, frequently have friends from the South that come up here to vacation and like, what do we need to know? And yeah, they call it a park, but it's not a park. It's just a wild forest where we just called, put a fence around it, or maybe not even a fence, just said, this is a special area, and these animals will kill you because they don't really know that they're in a park. Um, and we, we love that stuff. We love watching people go and push themselves as far to the limit as they can and, and kind of watching to see what happens. And in a, I don't want to say it's a sick way, but in a weird way, you, you're kind of looking for that mistake. You're kind of looking for that disaster, um, like driving a trailer through Southern California um, in a truck that barely fits in the lanes that Southern California provides, where there's zero margin for error and everyone's doing 80 miles an hour. And it's, it's just, it's a scary thing. But in the real world, um, it's, it, it gathers as much as tension, but it's not nearly as acceptable as it is in this social media or television world, right? I mean, to watch the couple that finally has their last fight that ends the marriage or, or to watch a, a teen who kind of skates on the edge morally and then eventually falls off or, or someone who's trying to make it through the month paying all their bills and then that one unexpected expense pushes them over to the edge. Um, those are the type of things that we, as believers in Jesus Christ, can hopefully learn to protect ourselves against by creating boundaries, by creating space where, where we can allow things to happen. So we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. If we're taking notes, um, you can put, you can fill in some of the blanks that's in your worship guide there, um, and we'll be tagging on to this a little bit more next week. But let's just start off with a working definition. Here's what I mean by boundary. Boundary is the amount available beyond what is needed. So normally when we think boundary, we think a boundary to keep people out. And that, that's not necessarily the definition I'm using. The definition I'm using is creating a margin, creating a space, creating a boundary around ourselves where, to use a colloquial term, we, we have a little, some wiggle room. We have some space to live. We have a, some space to do certain things. And this is, we find this in the Bible and sometimes skim over it because we are such a busy culture. Um, and this hit me so hard this last week when I was talking to the, the boys about, um, you know, they're packing up and doing all this and going and going and going and going. And I remember those days, um, and maybe when you're young, you can spread your boundaries out just a little bit because you can react quicker. But as we get older, um, it's more important to remember to establish these boundaries, these I don't want to call them safe spaces because in politics that has a bad 
term, but, but to create areas where we can just breathe a little bit. It's that, it's that amount needed beyond or amount required beyond what is needed. Like in when you drive, so your car is about 12, 11 and a half, some odd 12 inches or 12 feet long wide, excuse me, and your lanes are three or four feet wider than that where you can almost fit two cars in the same lane. Why do you need that margin? Why do you need those boundaries in case you mess up? Like shoulders on the side of the road. That's why when you drive through a construction zone and they put those, those concrete things up, um, you're probably not on your phone. You're probably not dozing off. You're probably grabbing a hold of the steering wheel, white knuckled because there's no margin. There's no boundary for mistake. Whereas you get out somewhere in, in north central Montana where it's as wide as can be, you can Relax just a little bit because it's, it's not as tight. So the boundary, the definition we're using is this space in our life where we have some room to work. And I want to encourage you the best that I can that it's not something that you wait to do until you're older. If you can learn to do this early in your life, it's going to save a tremendous amount of stress. So here's, here's kind of what I mean. Um, in, in the real world, it's kind of our current performance is, is here, but we could broaden our current performance out to here if we really wanted to work. But then that takes up, that takes up all of the boundaries. It means having money left over at the end of the month. It means having an argument without losing your temper. It means having extra time to do some of the things that you enjoy, some of the things that give you uh, the most peace. So here's what the number one thing for all of us is what I think boundaries do. Establish boundaries, reduce stress. And this last part, I've never in my life heard anyone say, I just need more stress in my life. If, if I could, I'm just so bored. If I could have some things to stress me out, that would be wonderful. That is the most crazy thing because stress happens. Stress can, can affect you mentally, it can affect you physically, it can affect you spiritually. Um, but when we establish boundaries, it helps to relieve that stress just a little bit. And, and remember, in the words we're using here, boundaries, not to keep people out, but to create space to breathe, create space to allow God to move. Have you ever noticed that when you're driving somewhere and you're getting ready to go and you're running a little bit late, and you got to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, at about 7.30, you're starting to get a little bit nervous, but then you get in your car and you drive, and then when it's like 8 or 7.55 or 7.56, you start getting, the stress level just increases so much, the closer you get to this performance time, the time when you have to be there, those stresses are caused by not creating boundaries, by not creating space in our life. Or have you ever had a a family member or someone asks that if they could borrow some money or if you could help them with something. And your first instance is to kind of freak out because there's no, there's no margin there for finances. Um, if you're dating, it's kind of like when a guy or a gal pushes you physically further than you're willing to go. And, and then there's this stress that's involved in that. The Word of God teaches us that when we can create boundaries, when we can create margin in our life, it gives us a chance to breathe. Now, throughout this next few minutes, I would love to be able to say, I've done this and it works great. I'll just be honest. I have no idea how this works. I haven't figured it out. And if I can figure it out, it'll, it'll work. But I do know this. It's a weekly thing. It's almost a, sometimes it's a daily thing for me that when I plan my week, when I start to put things together, um, I have to physically remind myself, just, just leave this block of time open. And, and somehow or another, it always gets filled. And here's my problem. Sometimes it's filled with good stuff, right? It's not a leave a block of time open so that I can go to the bar or so that I can go gamble or so that I can go do all these crazy things. It, nothing like that. It's, it's sometimes good things end up filling those spots and that margin gets, gets pushed away. I'd even go as far as to say that in most, um, I know for a fact, pastors, even church leaders or or those that are just so involved in the church, one of the things that we do is Satan can use good things to keep you away from doing God things. 
doing the things that God expected. And I I'm, I'm, hope I'm selling this well because I'm going to show you in Scripture exactly what it means. Here's another one. Um, recognizing our boundaries broadens our focus. Now, you may not have ever noticed this before, and I don't um, I'll walk around a lot. It, it, if you ever watch the live stream, um, when, when you're watching a live stream sermon and the guy's moving a lot, unless you have, you know, 10,000, well, 10,000, 100,000 dollar camera gyros and stuff to follow, it kind of makes you seasick. And so it's kind of changed a little bit about how the way we preach. Um, some of you are like, well, I've got an extra 100 grand. If you do, just give it and we'll, we'll fix all that. Um, but it's... Um, some of this stuff is done very strategically, like there's no cords up here that I could trip on. And the color of the carpet of the stage and the color of the, um, the floor are two totally different things. And I subconsciously in my mind have created a boundary right about this, this little piece of tape. Um, you may not have noticed, but there's tape all over this place because of framing and different things. And this is Randy's tape. And if you mess up the tape, you're in just such big trouble. But I, I create this boundary. I don't ever, I'm kind of nervous, I don't ever preach from here. If you've ever, I've seen guys that do that. And in like preacher school, they'll say, you get up right in their faces. And I've seen guys that have done this and preached like this. I didn't hear a word they're saying because I'm like, dude, one wrong step and you're, you're off this thing. <laughs> well, if I'm in a space, here again, when I say safe space, I'm not talking about what politics has made that to be. But if I'm in a space where I feel comfortable, where I have boundary around me, I can focus much better. Now, that's a simple illustration with, with just preaching, but how does that reflect into your own life? How do, what are the things that you are doing with your spouse? What are you doing with your kids? Um, and, and stress makes it hard to focus. Let me give you the last one, then we'll jump into some scripture. Boundaries create space for relationships. Regardless of whether we like it or not, relationships happen in the boundaries. Relationships happen in the margin of your life. If you're going to develop relationships, you have to have space to develop those relationships. If you're here and you're thinking, man, I don't have any friends. I don't have any real close relationships with people. Um, could be a myriad of reasons. I mean, let's be honest, you could just be weird, right? And uh, you know, that's, that's kind of like my thing. Who wants to be friends with the pastor? But, but more unlikely than that, it's, it's probably because you have so much time, so many things crammed into what you would consider a 24-hour day that there's no space for relationships. There's no place for those things to breathe. Now, look at this. Matthew 22, Jesus is giving us the greatest commandment. So he was asked, out of all of the things we're supposed to do, back then they had an Old Testament law that they had to follow, and 613 some odd laws, some say a little more, some say a little less, um, laws that they had to follow. And, and, a, and a teacher of the law said, Jesus, if we're going to blow all of those, what's the one thing that's most important? And here's how he answered. He said to him, you shall love your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. So he answered the guy's question, but Jesus didn't leave us there. So this is, this is by far the most important, but then Jesus gives us one that's equally as important. And here's what he says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you know the story, they go into a um, kind of a question session of, well, who's my neighbor? Is it just the people I like or is it just the people I don't like? Um, and, and Jesus just kind of paints a story that your neighbor is even the people that you would be considering enemies. So Jesus said, if you're going to do one thing, love God with your heart, your soul, and your mind. But while you're doing that, love your neighbor and love people as you love yourself. You cannot do that if you don't have boundaries. You cannot do that if you don't have margin. You cannot do that if you don't have space in your life. I heard um, someone smart, and maybe someone could Google this and find out who it is, but they said that busyness is the enemy of intimacy. Love to tell you who it was, but just smart person. Busyness is the enemy of intimacy because you're just too busy for the other types of things. Um, now, so we're all in the same boat. How do we fix it? Because here's the way this works. We would say, well, if I don't live on the edge, I might miss out on something. So 
We get our kids involved in a bunch of sports and a bunch of activities, and we want our kids to play soccer and, and softball and baseball. We want them to play an instrument, and we want them to, to, to be on all these other teams, and they just go and go and go and go. And let me just say, I'm right there with you. Um, we started out uh, with, with my, my daughter, we got her into dance because Jesse loves dance, and so we just started that. Then we thought we need to broaden her boundaries just a little bit and we're trying gymnastics and trying all these other things. Um, if she wants to try soccer, I'll have to tell her no because I don't understand the rules of that game. It it's totally doesn't make any sense. I made a total absolute fool of myself a few years ago at the Laurel um, at the stadium there, like state championship game, and I'm watching the timer. It's like three, two, one. I'm like, yeah, we won, and no one else is standing up. I'm like, the time's up. We, we won. They're like, no, they put some more time on the clock. I'm like, why? Somebody just got to decide that. So I don't understand the rules, so she can't play soccer. But <laughs> we want to get her involved in all this stuff, but there's a point at which we as parents have to say, we have to back down so that even as a five-year-old, she can have some margin and she can have some boundaries. And someone would say, but I got to get my kids in because what if they miss out? And so this is good stuff, right? This is the bad stuff. I want to get them all involved in this so that they can experience all this stuff in their life. And someone will say, yeah, but, but are you enjoying, are you loving the life that you're living? You're like, I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but I don't have time to talk about it because I have to go to soccer, right? And it's, it's just this, this race. When I look back over raising my three boys, um, that was kind of the standard of our life, right? We were trying to get our kids to do all these things. My wife and I are both working. Um, we want to get them involved. We want to spend time together. We want to do our jobs well. So what was our answer? Let's buy a dog because that makes total sense. And then we don't want the poor dog to be alone. Let's buy two dogs and, uh, you know, we didn't have the $36 to spay and neuter these two dogs. So now we have eight little puppies that we have to get rid of. And, and the whole time it felt so right and it felt like that was the decision. Looking back on it, we just chuckle. Um, we, just, we just laugh because we created those spots for ourselves. So to have relationships... And to further those relationships and to have peace of mind, we have to absolutely have margin. And here's my lie, and I don't know if it's your lie. I'll just push myself as far as I can right now, and then I'll rest later. What I'm learning is later never comes because something always gets filled with that. Did you know that God created us to live within boundaries? God created us to live in a society where there is margin. I'm going to prove that to you, then we're going to dive even deeper into it um, next week. But God created us to live in boundaries. So this was a culture, keep in mind, no refrigeration. There was no big box stores where you could go buy meat, where you could buy flour. If you wanted it, you either had to go to the market and get it. And, and the way that their meat was, was protected was usually with salt. And so it was just this major process. So if you wanted to live, you had to work. And you had to work consistently. If you stopped working, you might not have food. You might not have water. And so it was just this lifestyle. And so in the middle of this lifestyle, here is what Jesus says. Um, excuse me. Here's what God tells Moses and he tells his people. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. To which if he would have stopped right there, everybody would have said, oh, yes, absolutely. We'll remember the Sabbath day. We'll go to church or we'll go to the temple and then we'll go do our work. And Jesus is like, or God's like, not so fast. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. To which they would have replied, okay, yeah, but what about the seventh day? Because that's a whole day. He says, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work. And then, and then if, see, this is the best part about the Bible, okay? So check this out. Um, on it, you should not do any work. And then immediately, you entrepreneurial people in here is like, cool, no problem. I'll hire someone to do my work for me. I'll work um, people harder on that day so that I can do it. Therefore, I'm fulfilling the law of God, but I'm getting my work done. And, and I'll buy more animals to do it quicker. And God's like, well, hold on, before you do that. Um, shall not do any work. You... 
<laughs> or your son, right? Because that was the first one to go. Um, or <laughs> because right here, um, males back in that society worked a lot. Females did not so much. Um, some Hebrew cultures did some things in the home. But then you know the entrepreneur or smart person was like, well, then I'll have my daughter do it. And God's like, well, no. Or your daughter. Or your male servant. And then you could just see how these, might, or your female servant. Um, or <laughs> your livestock. Like give your cow and give your ox a break. Or the sojourner who is within your gates. I think that's pretty comprehensive. It's God's way of saying you can work your tail off for six days, but on the seventh day, I want you to rest. But it's not just rest for the sake of your body. It's something so much more significant. It's rest for your soul so that on that seventh day, you have to believe in your heart that God will provide what you need for that day, even though you're not doing it. This wasn't just a fly by the seat of your pants kind of um, proposal that God threw out. This went on throughout the children of Israel, throughout the entire Old Testament, even pushed its way into the New Testament, even until about the 1500s, this was something that was so significant. Nothing happened on the Sabbath. God would say, you can do as much work as you want, but Friday at midnight or Friday at dusk, you're done. And you're going to take 24 hours to realize that everything good comes from God and it's going to stress you out and it's going to seem like it's not okay, but what's going to happen is you're going to put boundaries in your life and it's going to create space um, for margin. He goes on just a couple of verses later. Oh, excuse me. Um, For in six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. Okay. (laughs) Can you see how your minds are working? They're like, yeah, well... I can't get as much done in six days as I can in seven, so I could do more in seven. And God's like, yeah, but I created the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is within them in six days. So if I could do all that, pretty sure you can take care of your to-do list in six days, right? Um, And on the seventh day, rested. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy. We don't preach about this much. We don't talk about this much because in our go, go, go society, It doesn't seem like it's needed. Um, God created us to operate within limits. And even in the very beginning as a people, he demanded boundaries. He demanded space. He demanded margin in our lives. So frequently, I've done this just with all of our kids. When When I'm in the garage and I'm piddling around or if I'm out at the house or doing stuff, kind of fixing things, cleaning up, Kids will come out there and play with me. Um, And I've just, from very earliest ages, Paisley knows there's a boundary at at our our end of our driveway where the curb kind of drops off. And she was playing with water balloons um, a couple days ago because I just love picking up little pieces of rubber all over the driveway. But she was playing with water balloons, and one bounced off the curb. And, I mean, it was like six inches. And I see her, and I'm just, this is like two days ago, and I'm just watching this. And she goes, and she keeps her feet on it, and she tries to reach it, but it's just out of her reach. And then I see her looking around, and I'm like, okay, she can't see me. What's going to happen? And she's standing there having this crisis that if I just took one step in the street, I could grab this. Um, And actually, there are cars parked, because we have have 352 people living in our house. Um, And so there are cars parked, so there's no way really she could get hit. She doesn't know that. She just knows that's the boundary. We don't ever go past that boundary. And then suddenly, after probably two or three minutes, she turns around and she walks to come get me to come get her water balloon. So she's understood from an early age that dad created boundaries, and, and I won't fudge on those boundaries. Then I look at my own life and I say, but didn't your heavenly father do the same thing to you? And you have no problem stepping out in the road because it's important, because someone needs it, because I feel like I have to do it, because I told someone... I would do it. And so I have no problem breaking the mandates of my heavenly father, but yet a five-year-old child can sit and have a, have a lit, or a five-year-old child can have a five-minute discussion in her mind about whether or not she should push the boundaries. And so God, even from the very beginning, was super serious about this. So how, how do we do it? What is, this, what is that which we should do? And I tell you, one of the greatest things is that God would say, I know what you're capable of. 
There are some pretty amazing people here in this room. I know what you're capable of. I just don't want you to live there. I just don't want you to live in that space where you're pushing the boundaries all the time. Because if we get to become a pro at that, you don't have to trust God much. Because I can take care of myself. I can pull myself up by my bootstraps. I can do all of this stuff. To where God says, I want you to rely on me. I want you to take a day of rest where you do nothing but rely on me. So here's my challenge for us is to learn to trust God in the boundary, in the margin of our life, to learn to take a breath and trust God for things. To be able to say, God, I know I could and should be doing stuff, but I'm not. Now, here's the asterisk, and I almost thought about putting an asterisk up there. What that's going to require is it's going to require some good planning on your part. It's going to require dividing this stuff up into six days or dividing this stuff up into to things so that you can get the work done. It doesn't mean that you can be lazy all week and then take a full day off, right? Because even the Bible says that, that the lazy won't inherit the fruits of the land. So, so there is some process. There is some structure. But I've tried this throughout my ministry time and time again, and I have to keep preaching it so that you'll keep reminding me so that I keep doing it to learn to trust God in, in the boundaries. I believe you can't follow God effectively unless you have space to do it. Because here's the crazy thing. If God is the one that establishes or wants us to have margin or boundaries or space in our life, why is it that when the stress happens and the busy time comes, is the word of God or service to God the first thing that gets pushed out. I'm not, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking, talking to me. I, I spent um, three weeks, four, almost four weeks straight doing nothing but, but good church work, promoting church planting in Montana and trying to recruit people to come to Montana to plant churches, to save lost souls, to tell kids about Jesus, to do a parade float to, to try to draw attention to that Jesus is, is king and that we love serving Jesus and serving our community. This was all really good stuff. But you know what suffered during those three or four weeks? My time alone with God. Did you realize how crazy that sounds? The one who wants me to have margin, the one who mandated that we have boundaries, is the one that usually gets pushed away first. And I had this real realization in my life, maybe I could learn to push out some other things. What if, what if that was the goal? And we learned to adjust, right? People didn't have money a long time ago to give 10% to the church, and so they didn't. And so then the government came in and took 10%. You know what we did? We adjusted. Then the government came in and took 15%, and what did we do? We adjusted. Government came in and took 18%. What did we do? We adjusted. Now the government's what, 23, 28%, wherever you are, and, and we're still adjusting. It's a mindset for us to learn to trust God in those boundaries, in those spaces. Because here's the honest truth. I almost hesitate to say this because I don't want to scare you with it. But God, God can create time in your life for you to spend time with him. But you know what my experience has been? He usually does that through tragedy or through illness or through something that, that you weren't expecting. Why is it that when I feel like I am closest to God, where my prayer is is effective, where I'm reading the Bible, where I'm sharing my faith. Why is it, it feels like in those times I'm surrounded by tragedy. I'm surrounded by something bad happening. I'm surrounded by places where I'm forced to create space. What if, what if I could get it right and still have that same drive every day of my life while I'm still doing normal stuff? Because God said, I'm, I'm serious about this. I want you to create a place where, where you can live. Create a space where you can have boundaries. Let me read you probably one of the, the best verses in the Bible 
for this passage. Jesus himself said, hey, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. That's the New Testament way for saying, come to me, all you that work like crazy and you're stressed out. All you hard workers, all you overachievers, come to me and I will give you rest. Of all the words he could have said, he doesn't say, I'll give you extra energy. I'll give you better performance. I'll give you a better review. He says, no, come to me and I'll give you rest. I'm not going to give you the tools to do it better. I'm not going to give you um, a, a program to do it more efficiently. I'm going to give you space. And I'm going to give you a place to rest. This, I think, at some point has fallen on deaf ears in our society as church people, as, as, as Christ followers. He goes on and says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. One of the most eye-opening facts for this for me, just in ministry, and, and in your world, I'm sure it probably translates as well. Do you realize that when Jesus came to fulfill the entire Old Testament, and he came to earth to be the launching point for the entire New Testament, which would ultimately turn Rome upside down, which would ultimately spread out into just about every corner of the globe, although still half the globe that hasn't heard the name Jesus. But this massive uprising, and Jesus was about 33 years old, and only about three of those years were used in ministry. So he has about three years to cram all of this stuff into ministry. And how many times in the Bible do you read, and Jesus withdrew to pray? Jesus withdrew by himself. Jesus withdrew into the mountains to rest. You see this time and time again. I am convinced that if a pastor or a worker such as yourself in your job, if you were to do what Jesus did, you'd be fired. You would. If, if in the middle of sports camp, I, I were to just say right in the middle of huddle time, I'm going to go withdraw and I'm going to go up to the mountains and sit in the lawn chair. Be like, what? We have work to do. We have to go. Jesus has three years to redeem mankind itself. And he still consistently pulls away. Here's the greatest thing. Your heavenly father is patient does not want to create space for you. He wants you to create space yourself. I don't, I don't want Paisley to learn not to step in the street because she gets hit by a car. I want to avoid that altogether. I want her to know in her mind there are boundaries that we set up for ourselves that save us from a lifetime of disaster. In the same way your Heavenly Father says you're going to stress yourself out. Your relationships are going to get weaker if you don't create space. Well, I don't have time to be involved in a small group. I don't have time to serve. I don't have time to do some of these things that I think I should and could do because I'm just busy. Your Heavenly Father will wait. My fear is that maybe your relationship can't. If you're married to a spouse that has no margin, it almost seems like they're, they're not there, are they? You have a kid that, that kind of skates morally on certain lines. It's always a stress, and there's always a question of what you could and should do. Even in our money, there, there's just the stress that comes when things happen out of our control. But your Heavenly Father is patient. But the problem is, and the good news, after the divorce, He'll still be there. And if you end up pregnant, He'll still be there. <laughs> And after the bankruptcy, he'll still be there. Because your heavenly father does not say, if you don't do this right, I'm out. Because there, there's a limit to my love. I'm going to be honest as I know how to be. I, I, I love you and I say that, but I do not love you unconditionally. I, I, I might love my kids unconditionally, and please don't judge me when I say that, but, but all, all of us have a limit, right? We all have a limit to which we will love. You could push me far enough, and I may love you in the name of Jesus, just as soon smack you upside the head, but 
I don't have the love that Jesus does. Here's what Jesus says, that even when we were still sinners, he died for us. When he knew that we were going to rebel against them, he still went to the cross for us. That's the type of love we're dealing with. So before any of that happens, my encouragement for you would be to find some time in your week or in your day or in your month or however you operate, find some time to create space and to create boundaries. And what are you gonna do in those boundaries? First off on your schedule, you're gonna do nothing. But then while you're doing nothing, you're going to realize that your heavenly father gave you this space and you're gonna learn to trust him in the boundaries. My biggest encouragement would be to try to find some time, and I understand that some of you are so, myself included, like I said, I'm preaching this to me, but so pushed to the limits that, that we may just be able to say for 10 minutes today, I'm gonna create margin. Okay, do that. And then maybe make it 15. Get to the point where you can take a day of rest and the world will still be here when you get back. I don't know that I could pull it off the top of my head, but a pastor once said that you, you um, divert daily, which means at some point during your day, you divert from your responsibilities and even for just a few minutes to rest. You withdraw weekly, which means that at least one day a week, you just withdraw from, from your work responsibilities, from this busyness. You divert daily, you withdraw weekly, and you abandon annually. So there's a time in the year where for a week or two, you're just out. You're just abandoned. And, and you'll find rest for your soul. I believe this is a promise. Come to me, all who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So I want you to bow your head and close your eyes with me. Just for a second. Um, if, you're, if you're honest about starting this process, if you're honest about, about building this into your life, let me say that when you try it, at first there's going to feel like a void. At first they're going to feel like I could be doing something, I should be doing something. And, and while that's true, that's the place where you trust your Heavenly Father. Second encouragement I would give you is this. push out those things that don't have any kingdom value. If you're trying to create space in your life, push out the things that don't create kingdom value for it. Don't push out your quiet time with God. Don't push out your prayer time or your worship time. Don't push out the time that you serve because the Bible promises that that time will be given back to us a hundredfold. But try to find those things that maybe don't have kingdom value and push them out and give yourself some space. Because we will be not only more effective in following Jesus, we'll be more effective in loving others. And Jesus said, that's the most important. Love God and love others. So I'm gonna pray um, out loud. As I do, feel free to pray if you want, or, or maybe your, your time in just this quietness to say, God, what are some things that I could back off of? What are some things that I could try to squeeze a little tighter so that I can create margin, so that my relationship can grow. Ask God to reveal that. The funny thing is, most of the time, we know the first one or two. Worst part of this is this really wasn't even a conversation 15 years ago before social media. And I understand you get the news quick and you get all the things that are happening quick, but that could be the biggest time waster of them all. So maybe you just, you back that down a little bit. So as I pray, I want to ask that you do business with God this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, you know my heart um, on this, and I'm not at all coming from a place of being an expert, but I know what your word says, and I have full faith in it. God, help me personally to create space in my life to grow closer to you and to allow my relationships to soar. God, even help me with the good things that I might not have to do that I could push to the side. God, if, if we as a faith family could grasp this, I would just love to stand on the sidelines and watch what happens, watch faith grow, watch 
parents become the best parents that they can be in raising their children. God, that every marriage in this room, even those watching online, those that are out of town, those that are here in this faith family, that every marriage would be as strong as it can be. That there would be an unconditional love for our spouses because we have space in which to do it. And God, in those moments where we feel like there's a void, may our heart and our attention turn to you because we know it all comes from you. God, we pray that you forgive us when we blow it the first time because we're going to. And help us get right back on track to continue to create this space, to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. And God, help this faith family, myself included, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. God, it's in Jesus' heavenly and precious name that we pray. Amen.